This is going to be the uh, second book I review. Okay, so many of you have seen this before. Right, let's talk about it. Yeah, g'day Bush Camping Tools here. Well, I want to talk briefly about this book. It's the SAS uh, Survival Guide. You know, I'm sure everybody knows about this book or who didn't grow up with it, with, you know, as a kid. And uh, what to say about it, you know. Uh, certainly it makes for a bit of a fun read. And, uh, you know, a lot of things in here are okay, but there's also a lot of things in here that would get yourself killed are quite dangerous in this book. Uh, whether or not you can use them here to truly survive, I, I doubt it. It comes in many, many forms. Uh, it could be electronic as a PDF on the internet or uh, a hard copy. This one is produced by as a Collins Gem, imprint of Collins Gem. It has nothing to do with the SAS. It is not uh, in any way, shape or form affiliated with the SAS and he does go to say that in the beginning. So whether or not you could use stuff in here to really survive or not is questionable. I think it's really for armchair survivalists. Certainly you can practice, you know, uh, making the traps and all the kinds of things in here. But uh, there's a lot of myths that go along with these kind of books as well too. And they kind of romanticize this survival thing. Like out here, you know, right now at this time of year, it's, you know, you know, how would you survive out here, okay? Well, you're going to have to have a proper tent for a start. And if you weren't near, you know, if you're like 20, 30 kilometers on foot away from any kind of road or civilization, you're going to have to have means to, you know, carry lots of food with you, you know, good packs. So, uh, yeah, you're going to need packs to haul stuff. You know, you're probably going to need a rifle if you can shoot in the area. You've got to be able to shoot. And that's the other thing about the hunting tips in here, or rather all these building traps. None of these things will work in, they will work in theory and in practice in your backyard. But unless you're actually a skilled hunter, your chances of catching anything by building these with zero knowledge of field craft and stalking animals, and being able to recognize the difference between pig tracks and deer tracks out in, you know, conditions like this, Okay, so we've moved further up. Here's a site here where the deer have been laying underneath the tree here, underneath the pine. They've come across here. Is, uh, you know, wild goats, whatever, it, you know, is really important, you know. So, you know, just can't read this and think, yeah, I'm set for survival because you have to know how to hunt. And, and even if you know how to hunt with a bow and a rifle, also doesn't mean to say you're going to know how to make these traps in here, but that would really help if you did know how to do that and you were a, a, already a hunter. Every kid has uh, grown up with this textbook, I'm sure, around the world. It's, it's been very popular. You know, I came across it when uh, I was a young teenager. Not this version, but a bigger paperback version. And you read through it and it's, <clears throat> you know, kind of very exciting. But first of all, I want to say that a lot of the information in here is uh, really based upon, especially the vegetation, what you can and can't eat, on the European situation. Uh, there is a small amount of North American and the rest of the world in here, but very little. And the interesting thing is that, um, you know, it's written by Mr. John Wiseman, who had a career in the military uh, a long, long time ago. You know, but it was mainly in the tropics, okay, uh, whereas there's a very little amount of information in this book dedicated to tropical, true tropical survival. I want to talk briefly um, about some of the myths in this book. One of them is the old fire myth of piling up logs. Behind the fire is this fire reflector. Well, that's that's a load of bollocks, actually, because, uh, to put it bluntly, uh, why is that? Because infrared is not going to be reflect. That's what warms you from the fire, the infrared. Hence, you can have no flames, but the red glow from those coals puts out a lot of infrared, right? So it's not the flames, it's the infrared. The thing about fires for warmth and using a fire shield to reflect uh, the infrared radiation, well, th this is actually a myth. The fire shield, what it might do for sure is to block the wind to a fire, but as far as really reflecting, acting as an effective reflector of infrared radiation, this has been disproved by so many people with long-term survival experience, like Morse Kohansky, 
and you don't need to be Morse Kahansky, a bit of physics, you know, infrared needs to be reflected off extremely shiny surfaces. And uh, dirty, dark, black, brown logs will absorb infrared, they will not reflect it. Now the caveat to that is if you build one of these log fires and you happen to put a space blanket, one of these survival blankets on there, uh, that will reflect a lot of infrared back, but of course you're also likely to melt the blanket and you might need that blanket. So they're a bit of a myth and there's a lot of effort to cut all these logs, to build these reflectors when you're better off just, you know, the, the way to go about proper survival is wear the right layers, the right clothing here. You know, I've got several layers on of different materials. The ones closest to my skin are uh, ones that wick the moisture away so I can do a lot of heavy exercise out here carrying packs, trudging up the snow, up this valley, up to the top of the mountain and back and it's going to wick away the moisture so my my clothing is not going to get wet I'm not going to be sopping wet so you need the right layers you've got proper jackets thermal jackets I've got another jacket and it's a, a shell and a bit of thermal on it too it's totally waterproof pretty much waterproof you've got to have the right pants the right boots you know all those kinds of things that's really what goes into survival and the knowledge of uh, you know how to read a compass and a map they're the key things so the other myth in here is about building a fire or making a fire with a magnifying glass. Well, I know that uh, my reading glasses, I can light a fire with that, but some camera lenses, if you busted a camera lens up in an emergency kind of situation, some lenses, they will not transmit infrared because they're designed to have coatings on them not to do that. So you've got to be a bit aware of those things. Things like being able to, you know, tell north with an analog watch. I love digital watches, but personally I don't wear them because out in the bush, you know, you need an analog watch. With an analog watch, I can use it as a to work out where the sun is, which direction is north, etc. And as you get older and more experienced, you realize that <clears throat> this book is really only for um, it's really only for reading, just for fun, nothing more than that. I'm not saying that you can't learn something from a survival book. You read through this and you realize that. The stuff in this book is, um, it's just really just for an interesting read, that's about it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, I think, not just myself, uh, based upon experience, which is just nonsense in here, and also stuff that could probably get yourself killed, and you would never really attempt to do some of these things in a survival situation. So I know that's going to tread on a lot of people's toes, so what I thought I would do is I would first talk about what is uh, what I don't think um, a satisfactory practices or um, in reality good things to do uh, in the book rather than say what is what is good in the book and what does work. So let's start with uh, there's a section in here about food and about animals it's talking about eating monkeys and apes well uh, most people would know that if they're into survival these days eating uh, monkeys and apes that would be a very bad thing as far as uh, which we now know is called bush meat, of course, uh, survival situation or not, that would be a bad thing to eat as there are many uh, diseases which could be communicable to humans uh, if the meat is not properly cooked and even if it is. Another example in here is about, you know, eating such animals as raccoons. Raccoons uh, can carry rabies. It doesn't really talk about that in here. For raccoons, they can carry rabies. And the risk of, uh, if you get rabies, it's a death sentence out in the wild, right? So presumably you're beating a raccoon because you're in the wild and you've run out of food. Or, or, um, if, if, or even an urban uh, raccoon coming into urban areas. If you contracted rabies, and it doesn't have to bite you either to get rabies for one. That's the next one. Okay, so some other things, you know, this is not in any particular order. Uh, talks about the deadly blue ring octopus in Australia. Uh, it's only at, at present this type of octopus is only known to inhabit Australian waters and uh, it's not a tropical generally regarded as a tropical creature but they talk about it as if it's a tropical uh, creature that's that's not true there are other tropical dangers in Australia such as the cone shell which he does talk about down here so some things are it's a little bit hyped up in some cases that's that you know help with the marketing Right, here's uh, a classic myth. What else to say? Well, the plants in here, there's a lot of myths. One myth I really want to point out, which I really hate, is the myth about eating 
or drinking too many green coconuts is going to give you diarrhea, give you the runs. That couldn't be further from the truth. I'm not sure where that came from. I think that originated probably from some foreigner eating a uh, rotten coconut, especially these old brown nuts. They can, you know, get contaminated. Usually, though, they're a bit fizzy and they start going alcoholic, but they can get contaminated with bacteria if they're really old and they're picked up. And certainly that'll send you to the toilet. Yeah, so the myth is, uh, you know, if you drink too many of these uh, green coconuts or whatever, you're going to get sick. Well, you know, heck, all of Southeast Asia, they'd be sick. I've survived on drinking nothing but coconut water for months when we couldn't get uh, fresh water living in the tropics, you know, camping extensively in the tropics, and it was difficult to get fresh water, at least bottled water or anything, and we're cooking our rice, we're drinking coconut water, riding, you know, 100, 200 kilometers a day on bikes, mountain bikes. So, and uh, myself and my partner, and that just, you know, that's not true. And as I said, most of Southeast Asia, you know, uh, are eating and drinking coconut water and if you go to Singapore or somewhere like that you can be guzzling on the stuff and it's not sending anyone to the toilet so that's a real myth in this book and I've seen it perpetrated on YouTube channels as well too uh, as I said I'm sure it stems from someone having a bad coconut and it's ended up in a book like that the other thing I want to say in here just briefly about some of the plants is the uh, it talks about eating an arum I think called an arum in here I would steer clear of these completely uh, they're all poisonous and yeah there may be ways to detoxify these things just like the Australian Aboriginals go through you know some complicated things of you know cooking and soaking and baking and pounding to get rid of toxins well you're gonna die or get really sick if you eat these things stay away from the arams I would not even try to eat them in there somewhere like out here now you see there is really actually little vegetative material to eat you may find because it's warming up now uh, some nettles and they're safe to eat you know, um, but other than that, there's not much here. We've got pine, we've got birch, we've got hazel, but there's no hazelnuts on, on, on the trees at all. Okay, so in this creek too, the, I know there's some small trout, but they're really this small like that, so you go to a big effort to try and catch them. So, you know, in reality, you know, unless you're hunting, and, uh, and in this case here, this is a national park, so you're not meant to be hunting out here as well but uh, you know come a survival situation I'm sure no one's gonna hold that against you yeah so anyway SAS survival guide I mean I'm sure you've come across it if you haven't it's a fun read uh, but I certainly would take it with a grain of salt all right bush camping tools here thanks for watching